Hi, this is Jeffrey Tucker, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You might also consider supporting this podcast by sharing it and even donating. LCI needs your help so it can continue creating great content. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. Thank you for joining us for round four of the Libertarian Christian Question and Response. So last week we we did round three because we um, we solicited Ask Us Anything on social media, and we got such a great response, uh, we couldn't fit it all into one episode, or else some of you would just still be on the elliptical machine uh, exercising or still be on your commute, keep driving because you wanted to listen to us. So we had to split it up into two episodes. So this is round four, and we're going to jump right in. This is we we get this question uh, a lot in our on social media in our Facebook group in certain various aspects where the topic comes up. Grant asks, should Christians be pacifist? And I think we could even answer. I'll add to that: should Christian libertarians be pacifists? That's a pretty important question because it has to do with it really directly ties to the non-aggression principle. What does that mean? Does it mean absolutely none at all whatsoever? Does it mean that we're okay with, you know, responding to aggression with aggression in self-defense? How far can Christians take it? Is it an obligation to respond defensively with aggression? Where does the Christian see all that? Nick, let's take off with that question. It's a big one. Right. And we've actually done an episode on this topic and it's been, like you said, been brought up many, many times. So as an organization, we don't take an official position on that question. Uh, the the individuals in our organization, even amongst leadership, uh, vary on how to answer that. My personal conviction is yes, and that is simply because of the words of Christ, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, and then exposited further in the Petrine epistles, uh, the Pauline epistles, and the the almost unanimous testimony of the early Christian writers of the first three centuries all saying uh, yes to that question. So that is where I land on the topic. I try to be generous towards others who, who take a different position. Libertarianism, though, is again, as, as we've said before, is not an all-encompassing worldview and it doesn't answer every ethical question. All it does is it gives us a subset of answers from which to answer, is it permissible to use force in this scenario or not? Now, Christian ethics may cast a broader net than that that actually ends up saying, well, in some perspectives, it could be taken as permissible, but actually Christ calls you to a higher standard. That's the position I would take. But libertarianism and specifically the NAP simply answers the question, is it impermissible to use institutionalized force for this purpose? And so the, the whole idea of the NAP is that it actually allows for defense. Uh, it does not allow for aggression. I mean that's right there in the name, the non-aggression principle. But just because something is allowed by the NAP doesn't mean that Christian ethics doesn't call us to a higher standard than what the NAP requires. And so I just kind of want to it's, – it's a very fine distinction but that needs to be understood. So my personal answer is yes, I'm against all forms of violence on those ethical grounds because that's what I believe the New Testament teaches and what the early Christians following the apostles uh, taught. But you know, frankly, I would be happy if we can just get away from the militarism and the over-reliance on our human mechanisms for our defense rather than depending on God. That's a positive step. There's, there's a lot more that can be said and I think we do need to go much further than that. But let's start there. Yeah, it is a good starting point to say, well, we shouldn't actually look to the hands of men to deal with protection and safety and security and things like that. I mean, on a personal level, 
you know, a lot of people ask, are we a pacifist on, on a personal level? And Nick's answered, yes, I'm in that camp as well. Uh, I kind of nuance that. I have an article on uh, libertarianchristians.com about kind of my stance on guns. I kind of, you know, sort of jokingly say that I'm a gun rights pacifist uh, because I do believe in gun rights. I actually answered that to somebody and they asked me if I believe in gun, if I believe in gun rights. And I said, well, I believe in your right to have a gun. Uh, and he he was almost offended that I wasn't like pro gun use and ownership and like proud to be a gun owner or something like that, um, which was very, very interesting. Nick was there when that, that interaction happened. It was kind of kind of interesting. But we as Christians don't have to act in self-defense. And I realize this gets into a whole stream of like, well, what does it mean by pacifism? And we can bring up the arguments about what about a would-be aggressor and, you know, coming into your house and all that. We're not going to get into that because we've talked about that in other episodes. There's a lot of information out there. Uh, one thing, just as a strategic libertarian point, is it really is funny to me that the left, the Christian left, and almost invariably they would identify themselves as sort of Christian pacifist, or they would say that they believe strongly in uh, an ethic of peace. And maybe they don't use the word pacifist, but they'll believe in something that we would call Christian pacifism. Don't see libertarianism as at least a viable or plausible way to be consistently pacifist. I have had arguments with people on the left and they will call themselves pacifist and I will try to call them out on it and say, well, you're not really a pacifist if you're also endorsing all these other other things that are like really heavy handed state action. I've actually heard Christians, you know, been in arguments with Christians who make those make those claims. And I don't understand why they can't be more receptive to that. Because I'm like, listen, I'm just trying to be consistently pacifist. You might think I'm wrong, but can't you at least see the plausibility that a libertarian position that no aggression should happen against people who are otherwise acting peacefully is not a really good starting point for political uh, philosophy. And uh, so it is an inroads to, to some extant because you can begin, especially peaceful people who are thoughtful and are like really good at, they're like really about being pacifist. I have heard other people be like, oh, well, I haven't thought about it that way because they think of pacifism as a more of a personal ethic rather than a political ethic. And that's not always true, but a lot of people who are personally pacifist kind of do that. So if you have people who are on the left, typically they're on the left, unless you're John Piper, who I was sort of defending in that article, he's not on the left and yet he's pacifist. Uh, you know, if you have people who are on the left who call themselves pacifists, it, it can be an inroads because the non-aggression principle should appeal to them. And if you can make the right kind of argument, it, it very well may. So our second question tonight is from Jeremiah. Can something like pledging allegiance to the flag be merely a subjective meaning, or is there an objective quality to using the word allegiance, regardless of how an individual wishes to use it for their purposes? Now, this, of course, gets into the debate over whether Christians should pledge allegiance. And I think this question is pretty, pretty sincere question because it's like, well, maybe allegiance to a country for a particular individual might not mean the same as allegiance to maybe Nick or me, because we see that. I, I, I can't say that for Nick. I think he and I agree about this, about pledging allegiance is not the right thing to do uh, for, for the flag. Uh, so, But maybe there's a form of allegiance that might be acceptable for Christians to do. I think that's how I'm reading the question. Nick, what do you think about this? Well, yeah, I mean, it. I, I guess you can say to an extent it does depend on how the individual is approaching it. And this is another thing we've we've talked bef about before on this show uh, is, is it appropriate for a Christian to have some kind of particular commitment to their country or their region or their place of birth? Uh, and, and I think to an extent, the answer is yes, but it has to be very carefully qualified. So I'm thinking here of, you know, you, you, you read Paul and, and his letters and you know, Paul is, was the apostle to the Gentiles, but that wasn't his – the mission he wanted for himself. He wanted to go preach to Jews. He wanted to reach Jews because those were his people. God sent him to the Gentiles instead. But he was still hoping – and you see this in Romans – that by his mission to the Gentiles, he could still convert some Jews. So I, I, I don't think it's, you know, intrinsically bad to have some kind of particular passion – for the 
place where you come from and the, the people that you grew up around, provided it doesn't become nationalistic to where you're actually prioritizing those people over other people and hurting those people or, or hurting other people in order to uh, benefit your people, that's where it becomes you know, sinful. But to actually just have that kind of a, a, a desire for the people you're closest to whether it's by community or common culture or whatever, I, I think that to an extent can be okay. But as far as the pledge specifically, I, I also do think that really we kind of have to take some wisdom here from uh, the the example of meat offered to idols. You know, you can say, oh well, uh, the, the the idol is is not really anything. There really is no idol. But if the person serving you the meat you know, believes that you're partaking in an act of worship of the idol by eating the meat, then you shouldn't eat the meat because you don't want to encourage the idol worship. So to the extent that the people around you think that you're participating in this sort of worship of America by pledging allegiance, well, then maybe you shouldn't be pledging allegiance, even if you know better, uh, simply for the, the, the sake of the people watching you. There's also something to be said about the word allegiance. You know, part of the question here is, is there an objective quality to using the word allegiance? Now, as far as I know, in the Bible, there is, in the Gospels at least, there's no use of the word allegiance or something that, you know, resembles that, except in that the gospel, you know, the proclamation that Jesus is Lord and that we are citizens of God's kingdom, and that when Jesus asked people to follow him, there was a strong sense that our allegiance is to him and not to Rome. And so there is a strong contrast between what it means to call Jesus our Lord, to call Jesus our King. And that I think, you know, when I think of the word allegiance, the first thing I think of is that is what it means to say, I'm not a Christian and turning to saying, I am a Christian. I am, I am allegiant to Christ. Now, again, this is just kind of a way that I'm perceiving it and, and thinking about what does it mean to follow Christ? It, it's a matter of allegiance, which then, of course, includes behavior. Uh, so there, there is a sense in which the idea of allegiance does run up against anybody's personal meaning for allegiance. And we can assign that. I don't know if I would call it allegiance, a strong appreciation and respect for the people and place that you live and the people and community that you love. That I'm not sure I would call allegiance uh, because then you're committed to something over and above being committed to Jesus. So question number three is from Zach. Is there a correlation between prayer being taken out of public school and a massive moral decline in America? Zach actually elaborated a little bit on that answer for himself in on, on our Facebook uh, group. He's saying, no, it's not. Uh, and, you know, there's some comments that we kind of need to talk about there. And so this really is a question that's related to what a lot of people think of as America's decline or social decline in the West being caused by political winds that are changing things like taking prayer out of public schools, the passing of Roe v. Wade. Um, you know, there are a number of political events that we can look to in the past and say, ah, there they are back in the 70s, back in the 60s, whenever these things happened, you know, we could say that this is just one more sign of America's decline. And one of the things that I have learned, and it's kind of been slowly over probably the last 10, 12 years of, you know, kind of growing into my libertarianism and understanding a little bit more history and a little bit more about culture and a little bit more how people are formed. One thing that I've learned is that politics is downstream of culture. There are people in culture who will be affected by the types of political decisions, and they'll be affected after those political decisions are being made. Uh, and so there could be a small amount of, you know, prayers not allowed in public schools, and therefore we have a few we have few more people, you know, kind of not praying or something like that. But I mean, we're talking pretty small here. The culture itself is ahead of, is upstream of politics. And politics happens and the kind of change that we see in our in our society happens after the winds of culture have changed. And it's really important as Christians to kind of focus on the culture. It doesn't mean that the po political element and electoral politics aren't always important, but it is also important to develop a cultural uh, habit and find ways to promote enrichment in cultural ways, in ways that build community, in ways that uh, enhance our culture 
so that we don't have to ask ourselves, well, how did we get here? How did this happen? How did this political decision happen? A lot of this stuff is well beyond our reach to say, oh, well, let's go back to this year and the passage of, say, Roe v. Wade and say, oh, well, after that, it just all went downhill. It's very tough to do that. Um, in fact, and I don't have the, the statistics or things off the top of my head here, but or within reach. There have been arguments made that certain types of decisions that we would see as negative have had positive consequences later on down the road. And I've actually asked Bob Murphy this uh, on the side, and he kind of said, well, it's no secret that there are unintended consequences to bad political action. So it's also possible that there might be positive secondary consequences to negative political action. So, you know, it's a complicated question, and I think there's more to it. There's no... It just reminds me of Jordan Peterson and Kathy Newman arguing about, you know, single variate. Uh, he calls them univariate analysis and say, oh, well, here's one thing and here's here's what happened after it. Well, that's ridiculous. There's a lot of things that happened historically that have led to certain you know things like social decline or moral decline. So the, the idea that causation and correlation are not always you know together. Uh, culture is upstream of politics or vice versa there. Politics is downstream of culture. I don't look to politics to shape my worldview. Uh, I don't think a lot of other people do either. And if somebody is looking to prayer being taken out of public schools saying, well, that's just that's just started the moral decline. I think they're looking too much to the state to say, oh, well, this is where my moral compass should be. So I don't know. Maybe that was a that was a lot of me, you know, kind of <laughs> rambling and riffing a little bit. You can uh, make of that what you will. Uh, that was my best stab at the answer. Uh, we didn't promise every answer would be an would be an A plus. So uh, Zach, thank you for your question. So the fourth question is from Patrick, and I'm going to paraphrase this. If there were never a fall and we were still living in the Garden of Eden, would profit still be possible or or moral or what what would be the role of profit if the, if there were such a thing? That's an economics question. So this is really good that we can, you know, incorporate this a little bit. What do you think, Nick? Yeah, it's an economics question, but it's it's really primarily an an ethics question. Um, you know, I when we look at how we actually approach the topic of economics from an Austrian perspective, you know, it's it's a very logical uh, sort of science, and and that's actually one of the hallmarks of Austrianism compared to other schools of economic thought is. You know, it isn't overly quantitative and trying to forecast with all these fancy formulas that, you know, fail 99% of the time to accurately predict anything. It's it's a logical science. Economics is is based on what we actually observe about the way the world works and human behavior and all these sorts of things. So if we're talking about a pre-fall state, you know, it there's some sense in which we don't exactly know how it all would work because none of us uh, alive today have ever known a pre-fall state. We have no idea what that you know, actually looked like in, in, in day-to-day practice. But I, w- we know that capitalism is not unethical, that markets are not unethical, that these things – and the, the, the ethical foundations which lead to these things are affirmed by Christian theology. That's actually one of our sort of core points and core values uh, in, our, in, in our core value statement as we talk about that is, is these things are affirmed by Christian theology. So I would have to imagine that you know, all things being equal in a pre-fall state, uh, the, the profit motive would – would work the same way it does now. Now, again, there's a lot more that could be said there because uh, Christians in particular are are required to be charitable and we're required to love our neighbor and, you know, you're required to take responsibility for your family and, and for your community and your church community and all these sorts of things. And the church is a family ultimately. So, I mean, to that extent, there's a higher ethical command you know, pushing Christians towards caring for for the world in general, but especially for one another. Uh, and so, if we're talking about a pre-fall state where everyone's kind of in perfect harmony with God and there's no sin, then obviously that that ethical imperative would still apply. But that doesn't mean that the profit motive 
wouldn't apply because in a in a, in a sinless state you can still you can still desire to produce things and to profit and to grow and you can still trade and and I think in in the new earth whatever that looks like and I don't think we can get overly specific on what it'll look like but a big part of it uh, at least if you kind of follow the the line of thinking laid out by N.T. Wright and others, which I happen to on this point, uh, is that really what we're looking at is is renewed humanity in its truest sense. Uh, so it's not otherworldly per se. It's, it's the best form of what human society and life was meant to be. And I think that trade and markets are part of that. They just will be or would be unencumbered by sin. Uh, and so that's that's kind of what we're heading towards. And so had there never been a fall, I think it would have looked somewhat similar to that. Yeah, and when I kind of started with like mentioning that it was an economics question, I think what I had in mind was the part of the answer that I had in my my head as a way to respond. Nick, I really liked all the thoughts that you had there. It was, it was excellent. Is that, but, but my addition to that would be, well, the profit motive is an important thing to talk about, which you did. But profit itself is actually a function of how are, how well are we using resources, and you know we there is the question of like well would there be scarcity in the Garden of Eden, and do we even need a signal to actually tell us that we're using resources in a wise way? It would probably end up being a little bit different because profit would then be telling us well which resources should we you know be spending our time because I mean time in and of itself like if we had an abundance of resources. I don't take this kind of view of like the Garden of Eden where it was just like everybody could be lazy and not do anything or anything like that. Uh, and we just have abundance without work. Uh, I don't think that's what the Garden of Eden was was to be like. But if we have we have things, we have a limit, we have a limit on time, we have a limit of what we can do and production has its limits. And so we have to have something. There has to be a signal that says, well, here's what we should do with our time. Here's what we should do with our resources and our skills. Uh, and so profit would have that function as well. Um, plus all the other wonderful things Nick said. Hey, folks, Norman Horn here from LCI. Would you do us a quick favor and rank us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you subscribe to us? High rankings helps us get the word out there. And now let's get back to the show. So our last question is from Andrew, and he asks, for many Christian libertarians, our faith informs our politics. How do you answer those outside our faith who insist that the two worlds of religion and politics be kept separate? I really like this question because it actually represents, in some sense, a dilemma for Christians, whether libertarian, left progressive, or right-wing conservative. How do we advocate for something that we believe should be, and that is, you know, if we're a libertarian, we believe in either a minimist, a minimal or no state. If you're a conservative, you believe in a certain type of state that is, I don't know, supposedly minarchist, but kind of intrusive in other ways. And if you're on the left, you believe the state should be highly involved in, you know, almost everything uh, that has to do with human interaction. How do we advocate something that we find personally is in our, you know, like we believe this comes from our personal, like, you know, our walk with Christ or, our, you know, our personal faith in Christianity or any faith for that matter, I guess. Uh, how do we speak into politics without making it a, oh, well, we're using our religion to make political decisions. And I've actually thought about that as well. In fact, I'll, um, I'll bring up a scenario here in a few minutes. I kind of wonder about after I let Nick sort of answer, how do you, how do you insist that these aren't really in faith informing politics, Nick? There's a fallacy here that typically is, is is coming from those who who sort of make this claim that oh well, you can't be mixing your your religion and your politics. That's that's a fallacy insofar as literally everyone who has a political opinion is doing that in some way uh, because everyone has a religion. Even if you're an atheist, you have a religion. You know, humanism might be your your religion, but it's it's a religion. You're worshiping something. Maybe you're worshiping yourself or you're worshiping your money or you're worshiping your uh, sexual adventures or whatever. I mean everybody's worshiping something and everybody has a religion of some type. Atheists may dispute that. I, I don't care. It's a fact. So it's a fallacy to say that you know you can't mix your religion and politics because literally everyone is doing that. The question is, which ethics should be informing our political theory. And if you're a Christian, obviously you would take the position that Christian ethics should be informing your, your political theory. Now, there's problems here uh, that – 
you know, when you when you look at like political science and just the whole idea of competing for control of the state, if you're if you're someone who's a Christian statist and your your sort of approach is, yes, we're going to use the state to enforce my ethics, well, then you're gonna have a problem because you know, the Muslim can do the same thing against you or a Hindu or a Buddhist or whatever. It doesn't matter. But the hallmark of libertarianism, the non-aggression principle, I think is really kind of a unifying factor here because if you are a Christian, then libertarianism is really kind of a, a unifying factor here precisely because it doesn't depend on using the mechanism of the state to get what you want. So. If you're a Christian, obviously you don't want somebody from another religion using the state against you. Uh, well, likewise, somebody from another religion doesn't want you using the state against them. Uh, and you know, we would argue that that Christian ethics actually requires us to not try to inaugurate God's kingdom through coercive force, but rather through ministry and the gospel and service and love and all these sorts of things. That's actually what Jesus commands us to do. And so to that extent is perfectly compatible with the nap. But these problems only arise because of the state. It's because you have these different groups trying to take control of the state in order to beat other people over the head with it. Whereas if you acknowledge the NAP, regardless of your uh, religion, and you believe in freedom of contract and property rights and market forces, uh, a, a lot of these conflicts sort of fall by the wayside. Yeah, I mean, I, one of the first things I think of when I when I get kind of asked this question or when I think through it, and you know, Nick said atheists could disagree that you know everyone has a religion, and it doesn't even like. I, I kind of think of it in a little bit different way. Like, yes, I agree. Everybody worships something. Everybody has some sort of religious foundation, if you want to call it that. We have something we call God or is top dog in our life, what, however you want to do with that. But the one thing that I think of is it doesn't matter whether or not somebody makes an argument from a religion that has God saying, well, this is how things ought to be. And then this other religion, this is how things ought to be. Just take any assortment of people to have to come together and decide how do we work together how do we vote how do we how do we make a society work and it includes something like the state like what we have so just imagine we're all giving our opinions to the state on what who should be elected and who should make who who should call the shots and all that we're bound to have all kinds of reasons why we should do uh, let's say uh, social welfare for the poor. Let's just not corporate welfare. Let's just say for the poor. So you have people on the left, Christian left, who say, well, Jesus was all about the poor. And this is the argument they'll, they'll go with. They'll be like, well, if we let the Bible inform our politics, then you know our hearts ought to be with the poor. And it's really important that we make sure that we as a community, we as the church, and they kind of just, they, they kind of hedge on the word we there, but we should be caring for the poor is what their argument is. And and the the supposed implication is that, well, if you're into politics, you should just be voting for people who say, we're going to take care of the poor. Um, no, that's not it. But no atheist is going, no atheist who's on the left is going to like argue with them and say, well, you shouldn't have a voice. They're not going to say to the leftist, well, your argument that we should have a state that feeds the poor uh, is based out of your Christian religion. Therefore, I should reject it. No, they're going to be like, oh, well, Christian, look at a Christian. They're agreeing with me. So atheists, if, if we're dealing specifically with atheists, they're OK with Christians agreeing with the policies that they want when the Christian faith kind of aligns with the way that they think it ought to be. But when it doesn't, oh, separation of church and state or, oh, religion shouldn't inform politics. This, this drives me nuts when people do this. I actually have wondered, and this is kind of the example I was thinking of, if Donald Trump tomorrow morning got on, did a press conference, and he said that he spent the last 24 hours in prayer, maybe he was fasting, talked to spiritual advisors, and he decided he was going to do like a 180 on a number of his major platform items because he felt that Jesus was personally speaking to him that the country should welcome immigrants, that the trade war is really stupid, and that we should have open commerce, that all these things, like just list anything that anybody on the left thinks Trump is just horrible at. 
but he comes to agree with them because he spent time with Jesus in personal devotions. Now, I realize I'm obviously setting up a hypothetical, although, hey, that'd be kind of cool if he spends a lot of time with Jesus personally. I'm cool with that. But do you really think they're going to complain and say, oh, look, separation? Oh, nope, separation of church and state. We can't do that. No, they're not going to do that because they don't care about that. They just want people to agree with them. Do you think that's like a far-fetched uh, uh, a conclusion to draw, Nick? No, I, I, I think in many cases that probably is correct. Um, you know, and it can it can fall on the other side of the sphere as well. I mean, you know, there's – again, if we're using atheists as the example, you know, there's atheist conservatives uh, who are very militaristic and, you know, who are from the neocon wing of the Republican Party and, you know, they – I'm th they're more than happy to have, you know, Christians – who are very militaristic uh, su support those endeavors. Uh, so I guess this this can really fall on on kind of any side of the debate. Um, people are going to naturally gravitate towards those who agree with them. Yeah, and I think the one thing that we can kind of kind of end on this this thought is one of the reasons why I think that Christianity and libertarianism are majorly compatible, if not just inherent complements, is that when we read the scriptures. We see over and over again that the way for us to interact with each other is not domination. The way for us to approach any sort of power is to not enable it to have more of its own power to where it can just become its own thing, a state, that any sort of empire is just contrary to God's will and God's kingdom and God's desire for people to, uh, to flourish. Empire and human flourishing do not mix. And so if there's a way that a Christian libertarian has an informed, you know, sort of a biblical Christian informed way of looking at politics, it's essentially the warning, political power corrupts. This is not the direction of human flourishing. This is not the will of God that there is a concentrated amount of power in the hands of a few that lord it over everybody else. And so that's the way that my faith informs libertarianism or endorses it, if you will. I don't necessarily have to be like, oh, well, hey, I believe libertarianism because of these Bible verses or something like that. That's not the way that I get there. But I look at that and say libertarianism is the prophetic voice against unjust power. It can do a better job of it. We can all become better libertarians when we can find all kinds of unjust power, not just in the state. But that is the one thing that I'm like, that's where my Christianity applauds libertarianism is that we are against power that is absolute and able to go so far as to, oh my goodness, like the last hundred years of just absolute state power has yielded hundreds of millions of death. And so when freedom exists, there is life and human flourishing where the state is dominant. There's just, it's just death. It's just the end. It is not in the direction of human flourishing. So thank you everybody for submitting your questions. We apologize if we can't get to every one of them. We can save them for future episodes. Some of them we may not have answered because they were in depth answered in like several of our other podcasts. Or you can, if, if we just didn't get to them, you can look them up on our website. Some of those things are answered uh, in other ways in the past and so forth. And uh, some, some future date, we will have another question and response. You're definitely welcome to simply email us your questions and we will do our best to answer them. So yeah, if you want to email us, uh, send us an email, podcast at libertarianchristians.com. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. The audio engineers were Doug Stewart and Jason Rink, and voiceovers were by Matthew Bellis and Caitlin Horn. If you'd like to find out more about the LCI, please visit us on the web at www.libertarianchristians.com. Thank you.